Our uh, uh, focus this hour is uh, on episode five of the Modi Diaries. Today we are delving into how India, under Narendra Modi's leadership, has undergone significant architectural transformations. From 2014 onwards, Modi's tenure has witnessed remarkable social, economic and architectural advancements. Notable feats include the Statue of Unity, the world's tallest statue standing at 182 meters, the Atul Tunnel, the world's longest single-tube highway tunnel, the Kashi Vishwanath Corridor, a project worth 700 crore rupees has expanded the area around the historic Kashi Vishwanath Dham, restoring 40 temples and 23 buildings to their former glory. Other notable architectures include the Ram Mandir in Ayodhya, the Chenab Bridge, the new Parliament House and the Bharat Mandapam. These architectural marvels signify India's journey towards a modern era of architectural excellence under Modi's visionary leadership. Joining us at this point is Sumit Peer, political analyst. We also have Raj Lakshmi Joshi, political analyst, joining us live. Sharit Kohli, economist, joins us live. We also have Dikshu Kukreja, managing partner, CP Kukreja Architects, live with us. Uh, Sumit Peer, let me uh, begin with you on uh, uh, how much uh, you believe uh, there has been a transformation in architecture under Prime Minister Modi. Thank you very much for having me on your show. In fact, under Prime Minister Modi, that need of being Bhartiya in every aspect, which Modi ji ne kaha tha, dimag mein, dimag mein wo gulami ki zanjiro ko todna. So that has to go everywhere. If you look at the Nedaji Subhash Chandra Bose statue, which was, which got its rightful place after 74 years. If you look at the Kartavya path, if you look at the new parliament house, if you look at Mahakal corridor, if you look at, uh, you know, Kashi Vishwanath, if you look at Bhagwan Shri Ram Mandir, if you look at all those developments, if you look at roads, if you look at dams, if you look at bridges, if you look at the highest railway bridge in the country, if you look at the tallest statue in the country, that is all has come under the leadership of Prime Minister Modi. You look at all weather tunnels to Ladakh. We will look at all weather connect now, completely train going and crossing the Banihal and going to Srinagar. So these were the things which were pending for decades. There was not even a vision for it. Nobody could believe that we could have all weather connectivity to Ladakh. We could have all weather connectivity to JNK. And with it, we could have a Bhavya Ram Mandir. And Uday, we have discussed with you how big is the Sri Ayodhya Sri. It's not about Ram Mandir. 108 lakes. Five ring roads, you know, these Ramshalas, three star hotels, five star hotels, is few thousand acres of few thousand acres of development. And I think already 45,000 acres of development has been announced and more is going to come. So if you look at this kind of infrastructure push, now we have the highest number of roads built in the country. I think 55,000 kilometers of roads built in the country, and we are building 28 kilometers per day. That means more than one kilometer per hour. We are doing that. If you look at the Kisan Samanidhi, if you look at the money which has been put in building the IITs, IMs, if you look at the money which has been built for, you know, these medical colleges, engineering colleges, if you look everywhere, when you have $300 billion which are allocated to infrastructure development, you will have projects like Bharat Mala, Sagar Mala, Gati Shakti, you will have these big magnanimous projects which are coming up and Incidentally, I don't want to do a comparison. The amount of money we put on, uh, you know, infrastructure only is more than the GDP of Pakistan. That you can see the comparison because both the countries, because Pakistan was born, you know, he, he, they never got the independence. They were born out of us. But you see how the countries have reached. So this infrastructure, Bharat Mandapam, doing a G20 here, having the biggest vaccine push, making the infrastructure for that. Now semiconductor, semiconductor infra. Now these uh, dedicated freight corridors. Now, if you look at these, these these will kind of these will tell you how how the things have changed and how the things have been doing under the Prime Minister Modi. So these are the things what we should know, and these this is just a tip of iceberg what we can talk right now. But if you kind of go more into detail, there'll be much more than that. And everything of it has that touch of Bharatiyata, but touch of Indianness. It is not that you know it is uh, imported architecture. We were comfortable with the uh, we were comfortable with the Raj, but Prime Minister Modi said no. We were comfortable with the old Parliament Street build, old Parliament building. Prime Minister Modi said no. We were comfortable with Lord, Lord Makhati is there. We were comfortable with the you know we we didn't have a war memorial, but we were comfortable with the Amar Jawan Jyoti. So if you look at all spectrums and all spheres of life, the people from all spheres of life and across the India got that representation. And let's not forget Swachh Bharat. Now, if you go everywhere, you see the beautiful fountains, you see these gardens, you see these beautiful flowers, and now you can see paintings happening on them. The 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 first keeping them clean, building the infrastructure, maintaining the infrastructure, and beautification of the infrastructure is the credit what goes to Prime Minister Modi. Because he believes our infrastructure should be far better than anywhere in the world. There should be no comparison. You know, hai bhai, ye chalta. that chalta hai attitude has gone out. It is the best or nothing. That is what Prime Minister Modi brings to the table. Over there. All right. Uh, let me, uh, in fact, uh, quickly uh, 
uh, go uh, across to Radhalakshmi Joshi. Radhalakshmi Do Joshi, what do you believe has been, uh, you know, the drive uh, which has spurred this revolution as far as architectural, uh, you know, marvels or this push for architecture is concerned under the NDA government? A very good evening, Uday. And, uh, you know, um, uh, I'm so happy to see such a wonderful panel. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm uh, very honored to share the panel with uh, Mr. Dikshu Kukreja, who is another renowned architect. And today I speak as a political analyst and as an architect, I would say. So, you know, uh, for me, you know, uh, uh, I don't know if you're aware, but I gave an, uh, a TEDx talk on the subject of how we have lost this uh, thing about architectural identity in most of our uh, Indian cities uh, in recent times. So if you look at it, you know, most of the buildings, they all look the same and they have uh, just been, uh, you could say they have been just copy pasted from some Western cities, some Western designs, and they've just been pasted there without any concern or without any consideration given to the, uh, the, the soil, the environment and the architecture around. So this, you know, what I can see now, right now happening is that uh, PM Modi wants to get rid of these colonial shackles as, uh, you know, Sumit Pirji rightly reminded us. So this, this thing about colonial shackles, it starts right from the architecture because that is what, uh, you know, uh, that kind of builds the entire uh, mood and the mindset of every person, you know, you call it as a built spaces. So, you know, uh, this thing, it it has a huge impact on our mindset. It uh, uh, because uh, all of this, they had this thing about this British uh, imperialism written all over it. Now, today what we have is all, uh, it's not just uh, just for the namesake, but then there is a lot of functionality also attached to it. Like if, uh, like if you look at the Central Vista project, and at the same time, it has this new Indianness. It has our own Bharatiyata. It has the Bharatiya elements. So all of that is there. So there was a need for it uh, also because the new parliament building, obviously because of the deal limitation, you needed extra space. You needed to accommodation uh, accommodate a uh, uh, whole uh, new, almost uh, more than 300 new uh, MPs in, a, in the both uh, houses of parliament. And at the same time, you had to accommodate the new services. Like uh, in today's times, you have a uh, very uh, well developed, uh, you know, all services of uh, say maybe air conditioning, lighting, and the firefighting, all the security services. Everything has to be taken care of, which couldn't have been accommodated in the in the old parliament building. So similarly, in the other buildings also, like in the in Pragati Maidan, it it was another historic place, but at the same time, it needed uh, needed a new identity. It needed something like the Bharat Mandapam. I'm sure that uh, you know Mr. Kukreja will be able to speak more about it. But, uh, you know, uh, all of this added together, it is giving us, uh, you know, all these new landmarks, like uh, even the Statue of Unity. You know, this is something that is giving us a new identity. It is giving us um, uh, this sense of how, you know, we have arrived, uh, Bharat has arrived. So that kind of a sense of uh, belonging, that sense of, uh, uh, that, that pride was lacking, you know. So that was something that all these old monuments, even though they are a part of our heritage, uh, but you know, it, it had all the, uh, uh, like I was talking uh, about all this colonialism written all over it. So most of it gave you the impression of like if you walk in uh, on the streets of London and in, if you walk along the streets of uh, say maybe old Mumbai and Delhi, you'll find the same kind of an identity there. So you don't find something new. So this this thing, you know, this thing about Bharatiyata being added to our structures, our new, uh, whatever buildings are coming up, the Central Vista project, if you look at it, the new parliament building, the Bharat Mandapam, all the new statues that uh, we have, uh, and even the Ram Mandir and also uh, you know, the Kashi Vishwanath corridor, all of that have actually uh, given the functionality along with the aesthetics. They have all been combined in such a beautiful way that it gives all of us a sense of pride. And, you know, uh, a lot of people talk about the expenses involved, but at the same time, you need to see that it is going to bring in a whole lot of tourists. Again, you know, all of this, even the temples and all these tourist spots, they're a huge a uh, place of how you can generate income yeah, you know it's a it's a very big economical boost to any country so all of this was badly lacking and uh, you know uh, i think it will be even easier to maintain all these new places also because 
because of the way in which they have been designed and the way in which it has been uh, uh, built you know so th- uh, i think that this was all a very welcome change and i and i'm glad that uh, you know pm modi has taken all these initiatives to give us all these uh, a very huge I- iconic uh, uh, architectural uh, structures which are going to stand the test of time and i, I understand that the new parliament building will be there for another 150 years and you know hopefully we will be able to see a whole lot of historical events there as well so uday i am looking at all of it with a whole lot of positivity and as an architect and as a political analyst i feel that this is something that uh, you know we definitely need it and uh, i am very happy about all of it today all right uh, let me uh, you know take that uh, straight across to uh, sharad kohli as well sharad kohli uh, you know what has been the economic impact of this uh, a boom in the architectural space and also what has spurred this architectural revolution uh, you know under prime minister narendra modi's tenure well thank you so much uday uh, thank you so much. good evening to newsx viewers and my fellow panelists as well now there are two aspects to uh, you know infrastructural development one is you just make a structure you know you just spend on infrastructure which we were seeing until now for the last uh, 65 years there were railway stations where you you would hate spending time there were airports which look like old bus stands you know bus stations and so and so and the second aspect is you don't just make it but you make it aesthetically appealing i mean they are they are good to look at you know they are they are of world class they are international class they have a character in themselves like the the ram mandir or bharat mandapam you know they have a character and then naming them as well you know i'm not naming something after lord curzon or you know uh, lifians or something i'm naming them with a very touch of indianness as bharatiya tha as rightly pointed by sumit and uh, raj lakshmi as well now uh, when you when you spend money coming to your question when you spend money on this there were a lot of acquisitions on the government that you know uh, the government has borrowed about 155 lakh crores during the congress time these borrowings were 50 55 lakhs crore we borrowed you know you, there were acquisitions like without you know ex- i would say exploiting the ignorance of common people uh, telling them that you're all under heavy debt now you know each person has got uh, picking up your calculator dividing 155 lakhs by the population so each person has got a loan of so much so because modi ji has borrowed so much now this is what i said is exploiting ignorance of the people because our debt to gdp ratio and why i am referring to something technical here is because it has got direct relation to what we are discussing today because lot of it has been borrowed for infrastructure and for architectural beautification should i should i call it or for aesthetic appeal and you know you know we are still less than 80% in terms of our debt to gdp ratio the world's largest economy which is the united states has got 1.25 debt to gdp ratio which means it has borrowed a quarter more than its own gdp so when the world's largest economy has borrowed that much i think people who are completely ignorant of economics and they do not know if congress had borrowed only 55 55 lakh crores you know not withstanding what what it had pocketed not withstanding what were the kickbacks let's keep that aside for a moment but giving us giving us airports which look like bus stations which you hated to visit you know oh my god i have to wait at this airport for 2 hours there was there was nothing which the country had until now which you could say has got a world record today we got world's biggest statue the statue of unity so some a foreigner or a business delegation coming to india they would say oh i would like to not just the taj mahal i would like to visit the world's tallest statues the same way as when you go to new york you would like to visit statue of liberty if anybody traveling to new york from any of us i'm sure when you, the moment you land there it's on your agenda however busy you may be that yes i have to go to statue of liberty so why couldn't we have had these kind of monumental achievements within our country and you know i remember when statue of unity was being built the cost was around 4 to 5000 crores there were a lot of acquisitions on the government because i was part of economic debates at that time that you know the similar amount of money could have been used to feed these many people it could have been used to do this but buy fertilizers for farmers and so and so i mean i think that is a radically stupid argument to give when you're spending on something you have to be spending on that your focus 
is on that project. Now, if, if tomorrow if you're, you're paying a rent of 50,000 rupees for your house, you could say, why couldn't you buy weed or go for a holiday for 50,000 rupees? It's a, it's a question as stupid as that. If I have to pay rent, I have to pay rent. If I have to go on holiday, I have to spend on holiday. So I think people are gradually now beginning to understand that all the money spent on these infrastructure and architectural marvels with the countries, I would say in the process, and we should not forget Prime Minister's statement given a couple of days ago, that ye to abhi trailer hai. This is, this is just a tip of the iceberg. Wait for the next five years or 10 years for what, are, what is going to happen in this country. Each one rupee spent on infrastructure, Uday. This is very important. I would like the viewers who've got their fingers on the remote or elsewhere to listen. Each one rupee spent on infrastructure. I've got a mathematical calculation, which I would not like to burn away your time by explaining that. But the, the conclusion is, that it's got an 8 to 10 times multiplier effect. 8 to 10 times. So if I'm making a highway, Im imagine what happens. Schools come up, hospitals come up, colleges come up, industry comes up, manufacturing facilities come up. You know, these free trade zones come up. A lot of markets come up, malls come up. I mean, it has got a magical effect. Take any expressway. We are sitting, for example, right now in New Delhi, Dwarka Expressway. Can you imagine the property prices in that area? Well, an area which people didn't even know about, the Yamuna Expressway, people didn't even know today the Asia's largest airport is coming up there. So I think I think it, you need a very, very distant and a long-term vision to be able to figure out that what will be the impact of making this infrastructure instead of thinking that if I made Bharat Mandapam, I could have fed, you know, probably two lakh poor people for three meals. That is the only way some people look at these money spent. And I think it's a very, very negative way of looking things. It's a very regressive way of looking things because tomorrow these very people, they go and click selfies with the Statue of Unity. These very people put their reels with Bharat Mandapam in the background. You know, this is, this is being hypocrisy. This is hypocrisy at its best. So I think thumbs up to the government. And I feel that it is going in the right direction. What do you appreciate? My last statement before you hand it over to the other speakers. What do you appreciate when you land up in a developed country? When people who are traveling to London with, you know, the London Bridge in the background or, you know, you know the, the Big Ben in the background. What the first thing people used to say, and I think we are all traveled, very well traveled. Wasn't this the statement? Isn't this statement given by every family? who land in a developed country. Today, when that is being done, you say that I could have spent 4,000 crores of Statue of Unity for probably for probably upliftment of, of 20 villages. No, I'm sorry. You're wrong. You're being a hypocrite if you say that. So, therefore, my thumbs up. And I think we are in the right direction. And for a developed country, the only characteristic of a developed country, the very first characteristic, is a very sound and a robust infrastructure. And that is what is happening today right now. I, we are moving and I think in the next 25 or 24 years, I think there will be a lot of envy in the so-called developed world when they come to India. And they will say that why could we not have upgraded our infrastructure the way India has done. Over to you then. All right, let me, uh, you know, quickly take that across to Dikshu Kokreja as well. Dikshu, uh, uh, you know, you've heard what the others had to say, but you are, of course, also best suited to tell us about uh, what you make of this boom that you've seen uh, in your space, your sector over the last, uh, you know, decade. Uh, and uh, what, what do you believe has been the main driver that has is, that is led to this? You've also worked on a lot of these important projects that have come up in the last few years. So let me begin, Uday, by first complimenting uh, NewsX and you for bringing to the fore uh, to your viewers, to the public, the importance of architecture, the importance of good architecture. I think that's something I've been yearning for years that, you know, when will India awaken to the need of good architecture? And certainly today, we are in the midst of a boom. We are in the midst of really a movement, a movement which is taking India towards this dream of becoming a Viksit Bharat. And it's something where I think all the ingredients are there. And when we talk about, uh, you know, the projects that have been mentioned by my panelists and earlier by yourself, the list actually is endless. 
I've heard people talk about Statue of Unity. Let me tell you, we have designed another statue in Omkareshwar. Soon that will be also very big in the news. Again, thanks to the vision and the vision of the Prime Minister. Now, this is the statue of Adi Shankracharya in Omkareshwar. Similarly, while we designed Bharat Mandapam, which you are referring to, we have also designed an even double the size and much grander convention and exhibition center in Delhi itself, the Yashobhumi. So like this, the uh, you know, the examples could just go on. I'm glad, I'm, uh, I'm full of gratitude that we have been part of this movement. But what fills my heart with joy is the fact that the whole country is moving ahead that way. I was able to do the master plan and vision plan for the city of Ayodhya. And I can tell you, when we created that vision plan, the brief given to us was to think big to think long term, to think sustainable. These are the mantras that I've been hearing from the government over and over again. When we designed the India Pavilion for the World Expo in Dubai, the brief was that, you know, show the modern India to the world. I mean, yes, historical architecture is there and we all revel in it, but let the world sit up and take notice of what India is doing today in the 21st century. And I'm happy to share with you that the India Pavilion that was designed went on to be selected out of 190 pavilions from all over the world that were there amongst the top three design pavilions in the world. And this, again, is something that I will give complete credit to, um, to the government to the vision of, of the Prime Minister, because the march has been relentless. And you know, all this, all this in the midst of what we know is a very, very diverse nation. Diverse not just in the ec economic scales, in the culture, in the topography, in the climate, in the history. Everything about India is so diverse. And then to take the whole country along together as one force is amazing. I think it, it deserves credit, and I'm glad we are talking about it today. And I think this is just going to continue. I, uh, well, yes, I, I, we've heard about the fact that this is just a trailer and most, more is to come. But I would take it another way. I think the momentum that has been created is not going to now ebb. It's just going to be something which is really taking the country forward, and we are really marching towards becoming a global park. When it comes to the architectural identity, I must say that that in itself has been also a very positive development because as uh, uh, Raj Lakshmi was also mention mentioning, since independence, we, we were in awe of colonial architecture and we couldn't just get ourselves out of it. And today we are proud. Uh, and when I say we, I think every Indian, everybody in the design profession, we are now rediscovering um, the cultural legacy of India, the historical marvels that have been creating uh, have been created in the past and we are all attempting to create that national identity that bhartiyata which is being talked about now and we all should be really proud of it we've had tourists we've had people from the world marvel at our uh, at our history and our culture and here we were the ones who were somehow uh, you know embarrassed to create more of it and today with the kind of spiritual tourism the kind of medical tourism the kind of cultural re revival that is taking place I know we are talking here about a few, uh, you know, uh, ports or airports, but you know, the list is endless. The uh, number of highways, bridges, ports, airports, railway stations, all that have been created. When I created the Gomti Nagar railway station, uh, I can tell you it's a world class uh, building. And I'm not here trying to take the credit. In fact, not at all. I'm just trying to say that how this kind of a vision is getting translated, not just by me, but of course, other architects from my fraternity as well. But the Gomti Nagar railway station, uh, Sharad was mentioning about how airports used to look like bus stations. Now, here is a railway station which has been created which is even grander and more marvelous than any airport so that's the kind of mandate which is being given to us and i'm i'm very happy that we are being able to do this kind of work we are being able to uh, you know i have now architecture firms from around the world approaching us and wanting to be part of this movement earlier people were fascinated with international architects you would see ads in the paper talking about designed by singapore and designed by so and so today international architects I, I, again i can very proudly share this with you that we are being sought after by pro, uh, for projects to design projects in brazil in albania in africa and that's all because there has been from, you know, the government, this push of trying to project India where it deserves that kind of a recognition as an emerging global superpower. 
So I'm really very happy about it. But I again, I'm going to reemphasize that this is truly the beginning. I hope we all maintain that kind of discipline. And one word of caution here, because we all cannot just sort of, you know, uh, go ahead with the euphoria. One word of caution that, look, the vision at the top is marvelous. We are all unanimous about it. But I think the implementation deserves equal attention. And I think people sitting, helming municipal authorities, civic bodies, they need to understand what these movements are about, smart city, Swachh Bharat and all. Of course, there are times we look around and we feel, has, is it changing enough? Is it changing fast enough? And I think there, the wake-up call is for the municipal bodies and municipal authorities and city administrators to wake up and do what the vision or the, as you have call, uh, called him, the architect of the uh, emerging global superpower, uh, which is India, the architect who is our prime minister, has envisioned that for India. So, um, again, kudos to it. And thank you again for bringing architecture to the fore. Absolutely. And, and all of this, of course, also has an economic impact, as I was just asking Sharad uh, Sumit, you know, where it also helps the economy, uh, you know, through tourism and also through business, which comes in at these convention centers, which, which comes in, you know, uh, to see, say, the Statue of Unity, and which also, you know, uh, leads to tourists visiting far-flung places with better connectivity, like, say, the, through the Atal Tunnel. You see, Oday, if you, let's take a couple of examples to put things in perspective. Now, 1.65 crore tourists to Kashmir, highest. Now, we had Goa at 3.5. That was the number one in India. Now, which is the number one today? The number one today is Kashi Vishwanath. It's 13 crore tourists. Imagine we have spent 965 crores. We are on TV debates on that and people were shouting and howling. How come you spent 965 crore? Now, 13 crore tourists. Do a simple mathematics. 3,000, 4,000 spent by, by person into 13,000, in 13, 13 crore is around how many billion dollars? So you have recovered the money in three months. Now that has become literally from an economic perspective, a cash making machine for you. Now, if you took up Sri Ayodhya Sri, the estimate is that there'll be 20 crore people visiting in a year. Now, if you, if we're again, three, 4,000 rupees per person which you spend, three, 4,000 rupees you spend. Now, how, what is the revenue you're going to generate? So these are the these are the economical things which will you know make it look better, and these are things which people forego. Now, if you look at the Statue of Liberty, how many people are visiting it, and what is the amount of money it has created? Now, if, when you create infrastructure, it is bound to have an economic impact as well. Who could have imagined that Kashi Vishwanath would be the number one tourist destination of the India with 13 crore tourists? And with and even with our Kashi Vishwanath, we already beat in Paris. I think Paris. Is, four, is around 4 crore people. So we are ahead of tourists as if you look at the world back where the number one tourist destination in the world by physical, by the simple numbers is Kashi Vishwanath and when Ashriya Yudhyashri will be in its full glare and glow, uh, full glare and grandeur, we are talking of 200 million, 20 crore log visiting there. So these are the things which will revolutionize the economy. Then the Prime Minister Modi is called, Bhai, aap bhaar to jate ho jate ho. if you are going for two vacations, one should be in India, one should be out of India. Jao Bharat ko dekho. And for NRIs, get somebody from your fraternity to come and visit Bharat and show him what Bharat is about. So these calls put together make a difference. Now the biggest fresh water or the biggest river cruise in the world is in India today. So India has suddenly come up number one in a lot of sectors because of infrastructure development which was unforeseen before. So all these infrastructure projects have a very, very direct impact. Now today you are building an airport and after three years you know it's already up. You are building two more terminals. By the time you build two more terminals, you are building two more terminals. So when the people see the money put in infrastructure, that gives confidence to the industry. That gives confidence to the FDI. You are already the number one FDI destination in the world because we are getting more FDI than China. And look at our, I mean, Sharadji made a very important point. What is the debt? It's practically nothing. Our foreign debt is less than our foreign exchange reserves. And what is the cumulative debt of China? $53 trillion. It is three times 320 percent of the GDP. So all the people who are trying to make a who Allah around the debt and this money should be used here and there, they exactly don't know the quantum of employment in create. Sharaji made a wide valid point. From one dollar spent, you are able to create eight dollars of GDP. While in China, if you spend eight dollars, you are able to create one dollar of GDP. That is the advantage India has. So the more money you put in infrastructure, the more revenues, more opportunities to earn are you going to create. And what is the opportunity to earn? Opportunity to earn is jobs. That is exactly what is the definition of job in economics. So people hate this idea of Prime Minister Modi, how he has created these opportunities to earn. For them, the notion is a sarkari nokri with a PF and ESI number. Well, that is not what the opportunities to earn is. So it is a grand vision which has a complete stand of Bharatiyata. 
that Indian has in it, and we are proud to resonate that culture. And if you see the new houses which are coming up, new buildings are coming up, once we used to have those Western names, now you see more of Indian names, you see more of Indian culture, you see more of that Bharatiyata which is coming up, and we are talking about it with pride. Yes. This is what has changed today. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel, hit the bell icon.